Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming this afternoon. I'm Steve Cheney, the chairman, or I'm sorry, CEO of the American Security Project. Uh, just a little bit of background on me. I'm a retired Marine artillery officer, and in contrast to General Castellaw, who's an aviator, I'm here to lend dignity to what would otherwise be a vulgar brawl. <laughs> um, so let me just lay a little bit of ground rules out up front. I'm going to just talk for a second about why we're here, and we'll have each of our guests speak for somewhere between five and ten minutes, and then if we have some allotted time at the end, we'll do Q&A. Um, this indeed is a special day for us, and we're going to talk about American competitiveness. And it's been a plank topic for the American Security Project for a number of years. What has spurred this occasion was last fall we put out a product called American Competitiveness, a white paper, written by August Cole. And August is right over here, formerly worked for Wall Street Journal out of Boston for us. And it talked about how America is slipping competitively. World Economic Forum used to rank us number one in 2007. We dropped to seven uh, this past year. And there's a slew of other categories you can look at to see how we've dropped competitively worldwide. Where the American Security Project came from this issue was from the security perspective. And we addressed that in our white paper. We've got a couple of folks on the panel, and we'll talk about that at some length. But coincidentally to this, Mr. Alex Boyle and Alex sitting right over here, who's a Harvard Business School alum, read our report and told us, asked us if we'd read the Harvard's uh, Business School survey on competitiveness, the first one they did in 2011, the second in 2012, and we had not. So we put the two together, and when we compared them side by side, there's an amazing similarity between the conclusions that were drawn between the two. So we thought it was a powerful argument when you take the national security perspective on American competitiveness and team it up with the business side of the house, that you've got a pretty good force here to come up, particularly on Capitol Hill, and talk to our legislators and the staff members uh, about how we can improve our competitiveness in the United States. And that's why we're here today. Uh, we've got a very distinguished panel here. On my far left is Lieutenant General John Castellaw, uh, retired Marine three star, used to run the plans, policies, and operations for the Marine Corps. Dr. Jan Rifkin from the Harvard Business School. Uh, Norm Augustine, former uh, chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin. And Dan, uh, Daniel Desparte, who's president of the Harvard Business School Club here in Washington, D.C., and, and an alum of that distinguished organization. Uh, we are going to have a little shift here at 1.30. We are expecting Mike Porter here. He's out, out with the House uh, Ways and Means Committee at the moment. And uh, Mr. Augustine has to depart, so we're going to do a little hot monkey here at about 1.30, just so you recognize what's going on there. With that, I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Dr. Rifkin and let him talk about Harvard's perspective on American competitiveness. Great. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to ASB for the great work you do and for partnering with HBS today to talk about U.S. competitiveness. Um, so the HBS project on U.S. competitiveness started about two years ago. It's involved uh, about 20 faculty, including my co-chair, Mike Porter, who will join us once he frees himself from uh, lunch with the way he needs to me. Uh, the project was really motivated by two ideas. The first idea was that the issues we see with the American economy today, with stagnant wages, with record low levels of private secure job creation, with jobless recoveries, high unemployment even while we've got persistent job openings, low labor force participation. These problems are not just the hangover of the Great Recession, but reflect a structural challenge in U.S. competitiveness, which has been a generation of many. The second idea was that there was a role for business leaders to address this challenge. A lot of the public discourse about U.S. competitiveness focuses on the question, what should the government do? incredibly important question. Our focus has really been what should business leaders do? What are their roles and responsibilities? And our typical audience is a set of business leaders, and we have been out to business leaders trying to ask more of them to address issues of U.S. competitiveness. But inevitably, in the process of thinking about the question for business leaders, we've also developed a perspective on what the government priorities, really the federal government priorities should be. We start to share that perspective as it developed with um, first business leaders across the political spectrum, then with policymakers, with national security experts, with city leaders, and to be honest, we expected that as we did so, we would encounter deep divides, disagreements, but we found something that was far, far stranger. We found that across the political spectrum, 
there was actually fundamental agreement on some things that should get done. We were kind of amazed by that, so we put it out and we asked 7,000 of our alumni to survey and 1,000 members of the general public across the political spectrum, do you support these policies or not? And we came back again with a remarkable consensus on some of the things that need to be, need to be done in Washington. Now, I hope you're dying to know what those things are, but I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so, because, because I think to describe what I'm going to, to identify as these policies, and maybe you see more of a strategy than just a laundry list, I need to set a little context. I'll start the context by saying what we believe competitiveness is. The, the, the term is often misused. The faculty who fought over this is only faculty who fight. And over, over we come to the judgment that the U.S. is competitive to the extent that firms here can do two key things. First, succeed in global marketplaces. But second, lift the living standards of the average American. And the second part of that definition is incredibly important and often lost in the discourse. People will say things like, boy, the U.S. would be more competitive if only wages here were lower. Right? And that would make it easier for firms to compete. It would not look at living standards. It would not be a sign that we're competitive. It's a sign, in fact, that we're not competitive that we need to take a national pay cut in order to sell our goods abroad. Now, the only way to do both of those things, succeed in the global marketplace and also look at living standards, is to be highly productive. And the key to productivity in a country is to have what we call a very rich commons. The commons is a set of shared resources that every company draws from new product. Every company needs a pool of skilled labor, um, an educated populace, strong infrastructure, a scientific institutions that produce the basic R&D, a uh, rule of law, uh, rules of the road that send resources to their most productive uses, right? And historically in the US, I believe that government and business cooperated to build a very strong commons, the most productive the world has ever seen. But in the last couple decades, we essentially colluded to let the commons get run down. And the theme and the kind of policies that seem to get consensus across the political spectrum, the ones that we would identify as priorities, all have the theme of trying to replenish the commons which has gotten run down. So the kinds of policies that I'll throw out there, and I'll see how the rest of the panel comes about these, we think like the following. Um, strong investment in infrastructure in America. I think it's absolutely crazy in a time when interest rates are as low as we will ever see them, when there's unemployment in the construction sector, and when we've got crumbling infrastructure that we can't be more aggressive about investing in infrastructure for the future. Uh, high school immigration. Equally crazy is the notion that we bring to this country the best and brightest from around the world. We train them well. They want to stay here, create lives, create jobs. We tell them, no, we've got to go home. I'm glad to see you in Washington. We see you making some headway on that. <clears throat> uh, policies um, like corporate tax reform. We currently have the worst of all worlds. We've got a high statutory rate, a narrow base, a low effective rate. We've got um, things that discourage companies from bringing profits back overseas to invest here, and essentially lots of incentives for firms to invest in accountants and lawyers rather than more productive uses, and I say that with apologies to my friends who are accountants and lawyers. Um, I'd add to the list things about regulation, things about getting our federal budget on a sustainable path, things about tackling um, places in the international trading system where we're putting ourselves at a systematic disadvantage. Uh, things about tapping the energy resources that our country is currently blessed with, but doing so in a responsible environmental way. But it gets to be a, a relatively long list. But the theme I'd say that goes throughout it is that we need to have a strategy for replenishing the commons, which allows the country to be productive and allows both our companies and our citizens to thrive. Thank you, well said, great comments. Mm -hmm. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Norm Augustine, former uh, Lockheed Martin. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, it is my privilege to serve on the board of the American Security Project. And uh, uh, as I've been interested in this topic for a long time, I, I find myself uh, in virtually total agreement with the, the results that the Harvard Business School study has produced, uh, uh, several of their studies in this area. Uh, let me say that uh, to me, competitiveness is an acronym for jobs, and not just an acronym for jobs for the elite, uh, but acronym for the jobs for the middle class uh, in this country, and that, my comments will uh, relate to that. 
Uh, my perspective on competitiveness traces back uh, uh, through uh, my background. I, I spent a, a decade in government, uh, uh, all of the best department. Uh, finally, as uh, Under Secretary and Acting Secretary of the Army, I spent four decades in business and uh, less than a decade in uh, higher education. And in doing that, I've come to the uh, strong conclusion that if we have a weak economy, we won't be able to afford a small, excuse me, a strong military. Uh, the Soviet Union is a, a canonical example. Uh, if, secondly, that if we have a weak economy, we will no longer have clout in the geopolitical world. Uh, other nations will ignore us. And thirdly, that if we have a weak economy, the quality of life of our citizens will decline. And not those at the top of the ladder so much, but the ones further down the left, even on the ladder. Uh, I became concerned at the end of the Cold War uh, that some two billion do would be capitalists, workers, were going to enter the job market almost overnight in the global job market. And that many of these folks were willing to work for a fraction of the money that uh, we're accustomed to receiving in this country. Many of them are highly motivated. They're increasingly well educated and uh, have changed the job market of the world that major way. Uh, I had the occasion to work on the Hart Brumman study after that, uh, which was into national security. The question was, what do we need to do to make national security uh, stronger? And it was a bipartisan group established by the Congress, and the unanimous result, uh, there were two findings. One was, this was before 9-11, one was that Americans are likely to die by the tens of thousands on U.S. soil due to the actions of uh, uh, terrorists. The second uh, conclusion was that uh, the greatest thing that we could do to help national security would be to improve our uh, uh, higher, excuse me, our K through 12 education system and to properly manage new knowledge, namely scientific research. Uh, that was from a group that was addressing national security. I, you may be familiar with the Gathering Storm Report that was requested by the Congress a couple of years ago. The National Academy has conducted it. They have 20 members, uh, presidents of universities, CEOs, several Nobel laureates, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, the unanimous conclusion was that America is losing its place in competitiveness, read jobs, and that uh, uh, this was an area we once had dominated. As, as it was mentioned that uh, we dropped from first to seventh place uh, by those who rank us globally in competitiveness. Uh, this is not due to ups and downs of the economy. Those are going to happen. They have happened. They will continue to happen. It is due to a systemic uh, problem that the nation faces. Uh, problems in K-12 education, problems in tax policy, problems in patent policy. Uh, underinvestment research, uh, the federal debt, excessive regulation, and I can go on. Uh, these are not things that uh, are due to uh, changes in the economy such as we've seen in the last few years. Uh, the situation today is worse by and large than it was as I've traced through these various other studies that have been done. And I think there are several reasons why the situation is worse. Uh, one is that others are getting a lot better. Uh, that's perhaps the major reason. Uh, it's not so much that we're getting a lot worse. Uh, others are getting better education systems, better, better uh, factories, higher technology, and so on. Uh, another reason is, of course, the impact of the national debt, uh, which is a huge burden. I don't need to say that in this building. Uh, another is that unlike at any time until the last couple of years in my lifetime, the major competitive asset America has, which is its higher education system, is today highly threatened. That's, that's new. Uh, the higher education system, public higher education system, today has a financial model that probably doesn't work in today's world. Uh, that brings me to the role of math and science in this competitive world. Uh, there have been a number of studies, one of which got Nobel Prize, that show that between 50 and 85 percent of the growth of GDP uh, can be traced to advancements in science and technology. I, my own economic analysis shows that every time you add a point to the GDP, you get a million jobs in this country. And you may say, what's an engineer have doing, doing economic analysis? I, 
I would just remind you that I really am a rocket scientist. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, country, by and large, has been able to stay competitive as we have in high-tech areas because of uh, foreign-born individuals. In my field, Werner von Braun, uh, today, two-thirds of the people who get PhDs in engineering from our universities are foreign-born. Uh, today, we make it very hard for them to come here, but we make it very hard for them to stay here. And more and more, they're saying they want to go home when they get their degree. And more and more, the very, very best of them are no longer coming here. They're staying in their own universities, particularly in India, China, and places like that. In terms of production of engineers, uh, and science, but I'll use engineers as an example since I are one, uh, the, uh, uh, there's been a study by the National Academies, no, excuse me, the NSF, uh, of 93 countries asking the question of what percent of the baccalaureate degrees uh, go to people in engineering. Uh, the United States ranks 79th of those 93 nations. Uh, the country closest to it, uh, to us, in both science and uh, engineering happens to be uh, uh, Mozambique. Uh, we've been cutting uh, research in this country. We still are. At the time, other nations are increasing their research. I just came back from uh, Germany, which is about to take on another increase in research. Uh, sad to say, U.S. companies have found a solution. And that solution is uh, uh, if you can't find engineers and scientists here, if you can't build the tax laws here, uh, if the regulations are too oppressive, uh, and the most market growth is not in the United States. Uh, what do you do? The answer is you go where the action is, uh, which is not here. And more and more, we've seen companies take their factories and move them out of here. 40,000 factories closed in this country in the last decade. Uh, the, uh, but now what's happening is they're moving their research labs. They're moving their engineering centers, the logistics centers. And once those go, they're very, very hard to get back. Uh, Steve Jobs told the president that the reason that uh, uh, his company uh, uh, employed 700,000 people abroad was because he couldn't find 30,000 engineers in this country. Uh, as we sit here, Microsoft is building a, a major software development facility across the border in Canada because our immigration laws are such that they can't bring right people from abroad into this country. Uh, there aren't enough people in science and technology in this country to fill their job needs. Uh, the uh, Harvard Business School and the uh, ASP have proposed some recommendations. I slice them a little differently. Let me kind of run through my list. Uh, number one on my list is to uh, get teachers who are qualified to teach the subjects they teach in K-12. That may not sound very profound to you, but if we did it, it would be quite an anomaly in today's system. But secondly, that we need to invest a great deal more money in basic research. Basic research is the engine that drives business in this country. And basic research today is principally done in our universities. And it's funding of our universities and for reasons that are, take too long to go into at this point. Uh, that's going to have to be more and more responsibility of the federal government to fund that research. Uh, next, we need to save our state uh, research universities. That, uh, Today are being privatized uh, by this, their states uh, through lack of investment. Uh, but those universities have no endowment, such as our great private universities do. Tax policy, you've heard about, I'll add no more. Uh, and finally, uh, encouraging uh, really bright foreign born individuals in fields that can add to America's economy and create jobs for Americans. Uh, they don't take jobs from Americans create them for Americans to allow them to come here and to stay here. Uh, but most, over half the companies in uh, Silicon Valley were started by at least one founder who was not American born. Uh, let me just conclude by saying that I, I've sat in my life, I've got long in years I guess, because I've sat in over 500 board meetings of uh, Fortune 100 companies. And in many of those meetings we were debating, do we build a new plant or whatever? Uh, in the United States, or do we build it in XYZ country? And increasingly, XYZ is winning. And it's not that the boardrooms aren't filled with loyal Americans, they are. But the law of this country says that uh, you also have to look out for the shareholders. And today, looking out for the shareholders of this country 
often means going abroad. And if that happens, uh, Americans will suffer. The CEOs will still get their bonuses, though they still get it for business done abroad. The U.S. shareholders will get their dividends for business done abroad. The American person who's seeking a job won't be able to find one in this country. They'll have to move abroad to find a job. Uh, the thing that's really at stake here, in my mind, is the American dream. I, I live the American dream. My wife is an immigrant to live the American dream. And that's what we're talking about. And that's why a retired guy like me is spending his time uh, talking about competitive jobs, education, uh, tax policy, and so on. I thank you so much for uh, listening and for what you're doing. Norm, thanks for those uplifting comments. The, uh, let me turn it over to General Castello to get a national security perspective on it. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, it's a real honor for me to be up here at Old Marine with this group. You know, most of the people up here, you know, you graduated or teach at Harvard and you know, went to Princeton and Naval Academy or something like that. I got my master's from the American Military University, Box 506, Charlestown, West Virginia. In addition to that, the Marine Corps never sent me to any institution that required any, any intellectual capabilities <laughs> to be here to do that. I went to NATO Defense College, which was supposed to be your top level course, and had two types of, re of readings suggested and recommended. <laughs> <laughs> but it had a very happy hour. <laughs> you know, uh, I was in the Marine Corps for 36 years. Uh, when I graduated from the University of Tennessee at Martin with a new degree in agriculture, I told my wife, I said, honey, three more years and we're back on the farm. And it took 36 years uh, to get back to that farm. I was a fifth generation uh, farmer uh, from a little uh, county in West Tennessee. And uh, going into the military is something that, uh, that we do. Uh, the 15% of the United States uh, that are the rural population uh, across the country makes up 40% of those who serve in the military. So uh, it's the type of environment, of the uh, feeling for uh, service to the community and to the nation. But as I went through that 36 years, uh, I missed a generation. And so when I retired from the Marine Corps, transitioned to civil civilian life, I went back at uh, the Crockett County, and I looked at what's going on there at that time. And what I saw was this. All the small businesses had pretty much melted away. You know, when I left, we had a Ford dealership, we had a Chevy dealership, and the county wasn't about, you know, 13,000 people. We don't even yet have a uh, stoplight, uh, a traffic light. We had three or four tractor dealerships. Uh, we had, you know, Brown Shoe, and, and we had a very interesting company we called the Corset Factory, where they made women's undergarments, and uh, it was one of the economic uh, pillars of the community. And when you went to Little League games uh, where I played, and all, you know, you were, you know, you had a Little League uniform, and on the back of it, you know, sponsored by the Corset Factory, yeah, which was pretty interesting. I never played for that team. <laughs> And so uh, the education uh, also, uh, you, know, you could tell the difference in education. My mother was the first one in uh, both sides of my family that ever went to college, the first one that ever get a degree. And so even at that, we had that uh, you know, personal interaction in the schools and so forth that was so important to build. And you know, out of that little community, we had to, uh, a couple of ambassadors, uh, sec assistant secretary of defense, uh, and a number of others uh, who uh, went on to become leaders in, in business and in community and in politics. And uh, what I saw when I left was a sense of community, a sense, a, a sense of belonging, uh, participation. And when I came back, uh, that was not there. What was even more uh, disconcerting was the average income uh, for the people in that county was less than it was. The train that came through the county attracted 
Thank you. And then you can see the infrastructure was uh, continuing to, to deteriorate. Uh, so as I became um, a civilian and started also uh, to be uh, concerned, continue to be concerned with national security, I started to look at okay, just what makes the, the strength of America, what makes us the power that we are. It's certainly not military power uh, alone. Uh, that is just one element. I mean, we've been at war for 12 years. I'll always remember being on a dam in western Iraq, beneath the dam, looking down at the, the Euphrates River and, and uh, watching a column of Marines come back to the uh, secure area. And it's just as they were coming around a corner, I saw one of the biggest explosions I've ever seen in my life when the IED went off. All those years we've been sending these veterans to war and then coming back, and what have they been coming back to? They haven't been coming back for the jobs that they deserve for their sacrifice. They haven't been coming back for the jobs that their community needs to thrive. And so what we need to do for our security is that we need to look at how can we create an environment that supports the small businesses? How can we bring them back? How can we provide those jobs for those people who want to live and work in the communities and contribute and, and strengthen the fiber, the fiber, which is the basic strength of, uh, of the United States. We also need to look at how we do energy. You know, when I was in college, uh, you know, I had a 69 Chevelle 396 Super Sport Canary Yellow with a black vinyl top. I had a bunch of girls. <laughs> But I also filled up at 22 cents a gallon. And uh, they get me all that bar out of the, the car at 396, got six miles for the gallon, but you know, I, I was fast getting there. Uh, we need to have a reasonable, practical energy policy that takes advantage of what we have in a balanced way and moves us down the road to where we need to be with our concerns with the environment. Uh, we need to be uh, conserving of our natural resources, uh, the water, and the land, the trees, and all that. All of this contributes to being a community and a God and strength that you underline our great nation. Uh, and I think the key to this, and the other things have been mentioned, so I won't go through that again, is that we need to have an integrated approach. You know, when you go in the military, the first thing you learn is a five-paragraph order, situation, mission, execution, logistics, and admin, and log. And you go through it, and that way you get a, a plan that is, has some analysis behind it and, and gives you a, a actionable a way of getting where you want. And so that's what we need to do. So we need to bring in all those elements of our national power military, economic, and diplomatic, uh, you know, our educational resources, all those things that have been mentioned here, and put it together in an integrated way that gets us from where we are now to where we need to be to continue our role in the, in the world. And again, it's great to be here with uh, these smart people. And You know, I've got a regional dialectical speech in heaven. I know some of you out there can't understand so the draw, so after it's over with, I'll write it out for you. <laughs> if you think for a second that General Castellar, a good old boy from down the farm, has lulled you into a false sense of security. Um, I see Dr. Porter has joined us. Uh, Mike, let me introduce Dante and let him give his talk, and then I'll bring up the speed about where we stand here. Dante, sure. Thanks. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and uh, thanks for everyone who's, who's attending. I think that from, from my vantage point, I can put on both hats, both the perspective of competitiveness, which I, you know, subscribe to Norm's definition that it equals jobs. This is not a lofty term. This is not an academic term. This is a real one, and it translates into the real economy by middle class jobs that are functional, that have a career trajectory where wages will grow with it. Uh, work, DC is very good at creating work. Build a road to nowhere. Um, there's a whole host of ways of creating work in the short term. But competitiveness, as it is being defined 
by HBS and ASP uh, truly is something that is transformational and something that the nation is clearly lagging on, but I would subscribe to not nearly as grim a view as I think that the, the we've heard from so far. And I, I would argue that the fact that you have ASP representing the national security lens and Harvard Business School um, and really representing the voice of, of 10,000 of our alumni network. And myself, I speak on behalf of the alumni network here in, in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, where we have nearly 3,000 alumni. I would say that the fact that this conversation is happening is the opening salvo of what is hopefully a very concerted effort to um, put tangible quick wins on the agenda and not get lost in the fact that this is truly a generational problem. As, as Dr. Rivkin highlighted, uh, the declining competitiveness is something that precedes the uh, Great Recession, the economic crisis. Um, therefore, there are indeed very real, very structural challenges um, that are out there. But I would also offer that the, the, this is not a zero-sum game. America winning the conflict against competitiveness doesn't have to come at the expense of any other country. It really is genuinely an all ships rising uh, proposition. And, you know, um, many of the points that have been highlighted so far, I think, are the ones that I would echo myself, that fixing the tax code, the corporate tax code specifically, would repatriate, you know, right now there's around 1.7 trillion in uh, profits that are being kept in store abroad. Uh, multinationals, the very ones that Dr. Porter and Rivkin have educated over many years, <laughs> often fly flags of convenience. And those flags of convenience, much like you know, in the shipping industry, allow them to dock in ports where it's uh, convenient to you know, create work, labor, access to markets, and so on and so forth. Um, but this nation doesn't have to necessarily be the one um, that is in decline, and, and it doesn't have to come at the expense of any other country that's out there. Uh, and I think that, frankly, this, this conversation, what these two separate reports and the two lenses that they represent, um, bring, you know, in my view, a lot of sort of opportunities that are very tangible for, for change, uh, especially here in D.C. But I, I don't want to stand in the way of uh, Dr. Porter's remarks. I'm sure everybody in the room wants to hear them. So that's kind of my view in, in a few words. Dante, thank you. Uh, Dr. Porter, we're delighted you can make it. He comes from the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, making best use of our assets, of course. Uh, we had Norm Augustine in your seat before we hot bumped, so we could, we could get in here. He gave an interesting business perspective on competitiveness and gave some great anecdotal stories. General Castella down on the farm told us about rural Tennessee and the impact it's had there. And then he, he pitched the national security side of the house, certainly after his 36 years as a Marine. Jan, of course, addressed the Harvard Business School survey and uh, offers a lot of ways we can improve our competitiveness, but we're, we're very anxious to hear your views on it, and we're so pleased that you're here. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, sorry to be late. Uh, we, I had an opportunity to, to, to speak to the Republican members of the House Ways and Means Committee. And they're in a position of enormous influence, and uh, uh, frankly, it was, it was a very a very hopeful discussion and a very interesting discussion uh, with them. And, um, um, and um, so I'm, I'm sorry that kept me away from the beginning of this panel. And, and it's a little awkward to not know what's been said. You know, I don't want to repeat uh, too much of what's been said, but uh, let me just maybe add a perspective uh, on, on many of the things that have been said that in some cases will repeat, but, but hopefully in a way that will be educating and illuminating. Um, so I think the uh, I think the, the this whole issue of competitiveness uh, is an awkward issue because the word is so dysfunctional, uh, you know, and it scares people and they don't know what it means. And typically, if you went out to a factory floor and asked a typical employee, "Well, what's competitiveness?" You know, they probably wouldn't have much of an idea. Um, and I think it conjures up issues of big business and uh, of corporate profits and. Um, that have actually distracted us from uh, what the issue is really all about. Uh, I know Jan shared our definition with you. Uh, competitiveness is where we can create a business environment where companies based in America can actually uh, uh, compete successfully in international markets, um, while simultaneously improving the wages and standard of living for the average worker. Uh, it's those two things together that are competitiveness, not, not one or the other. 
Um, and, uh, and I think as I've been, been here for the last day and a half, uh, I've started to understand that if we're going to make headway on this issue, I think one of the first things we have to do is to kind of get people to understand uh, what competitiveness is all about. You know, um, competi you know, competitiveness in the United States as a business location is not a problem for General Electric. They're going to do fine. They're a global company, they'll locate where they have to, they'll hire people where it's, where it's efficient and effective. Uh, if corporate taxes are silly in this country, they just won't have many of them because they won't do much in this country. Uh, they're going to do fine. The multinationals in America are generally doing well. It's not American companies, multinationals that are struggling. It's actually America as a place to do business that's struggling. Um, you know, people with PhDs and Harvard MBAs and computer science uh, master's degrees are going to do fine. Even if we don't deal with competitiveness problem in America, they're, they're going to do okay. Uh, because we'll always have a, a, good, a good large chunk of very high-end, sophisticated work in America because of our universities, our innovation, our science, our technology. So, so competitiveness is not fundamentally about American multinationals. It's not fundamentally about very highly skilled, highly educated people. Competitiveness is fundamentally about a semi-skilled worker who's middle class or lower middle class. That's where the fault line is of this issue. Those are the people that will not prosper and not advance and not have opportunity if we don't address this issue. Those are the people. And I think uh, if, if mo mo most of the general public doesn't understand that. Uh, they, they would think that the competitiveness is, is about you know, the, the, these other folks. But really, it's, it's, re it's really about them. The stakes of this issue are profound because if middle class people in America and lower middle class people are not able to find a, a good well paying job and if they're not able to see their wages go up at a reasonable rate over time, uh, and these are fundamental problems that I'm sure Jan has talked about where all the data is just frightening. Uh, if, that, if we can't solve that issue, then what's gonna happen? We're just gonna have growing inequality, okay? And we're already seeing what happens when you have inequality in a society if people don't feel like they have an opportunity to kind of rise up. You start to see a political system that becomes incredibly polarized, where passing pro-business, pragmatic legislation becomes almost impossible, where um, people get elected on a, you know, we've got to redistribute income per, uh, platform, and, and, and we, we simply get it into a downward spiral. So, so I, I think what has animated us at the school and has animated me on this issue is, is, is not to you know, help American business be more successful in, internationally, but, but, but actually the profound uh, effect on our society and everything that America has historically stood for. Uh, and, and this is not an abstract, you know, geeky, phrase called competitiveness. This is about real people and real incomes and real opportunity and whether the next generation will be able to go to college and all those kind of things that we have taken for granted in America. But as Jan has probably covered, you know, we're, we're in a situation now where the trajectory of our economy is, 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 is taking a path that we have not seen in, in at least 60 years. We've had, we have many, many decades of progress. We started out with an un beatable lead after World War II, everybody else was devastated, we were so far ahead. We've been dynamic and innovative and entrepreneurial. And, you know, we used to have the most efficient business environment by far. We were the place where the logistics were efficient, uh, uh, you know, doing you know, flexibility, labor was efficient, the regula regulation was pragmatic and relatively efficient. And it was those other countries that were all tangled up in, 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 in red tape and delay. And, and, uh, and, and, and class issues, and, and, and now, uh, now it's us. And uh, so I, I think the state, I, I just would like to reiterate how important this question is, and, and frankly, this is why Harvard Business School, for the first time ever, has decided to take an issue like this on as an institution. Not write a few papers, not publish a few articles, not teach a few classes, but actually take an issue on. And, and that's why, you know, Jan Rifkin and I are, are here, you know, and spending days and days and days of our time on this issue because there's nothing more important to the future of business, there's nothing more important to us at, at Harvard. So I, I now, the, the, you've heard the diagnosis, uh, it's not very controversial. Uh, you've heard, uh, our, I think you talked about the eight points. 
Um, much of that is not very controversial. It shouldn't be. A lot of it is common sense. Uh, lot, it's not new. Um, the, the fundamental question we have now is how do we get things done? What do we do to get things done? And so, um, and, and we have been here uh, over the last couple of days and previously trying to figure that question out. Um, now, um, at the one level, uh, the answer is easy. We can't. It's impossible. Because of the inherent nature of the political system right now, that, that is polarized, where we can't look for the common ground. Um, so, so one can get very depressed very quickly. Uh, and uh, as I have been shoveling back and forth from building to building and down these long corridors that I don't know which way, whether this is east or west or north or south, I, I, I've had moments of depression. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can also start to see uh, the beginning of something interesting happening. Um, uh, I, I've now had a chance to inter engage with four or five different groups of, of, of members uh, on the House side. Uh, virtually all of those meetings, except for the one today at lunch, were, were bipartisan. Um, there's a, a, a lot of consensus about the diagnosis, a lot of consensus about what to do. So at least we have, we, we, we've gotten to the point where we can actually have those conversations. There, you know, there's some. The, the, on, the, on the tax policy side, there's, uh, I was just with, with, uh, with Chairman Camp and, and, and his effort with the next block is to try to move ahead on that in an interesting way. Uh, there, there, uh, there are more and more little threads and, 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 and bits and, and pieces of, 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 of a sense that, uh, that, that some things could get done in, in some areas that we wouldn't have felt were possible a year ago or two years ago. Um, you know, I'm, I'm finding the freshman class in the Congress to be different. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, so far every single one I've met that's a freshman is really about, you know, how can we get, how can we get something done? So, the the sophomore class is viewed as as kind of the the, the, the peak of partisanship, but the freshman class I think has has come here uh, because of the time and the place with with a different orientation. So. So I guess what we would love to learn from you uh, is, uh, you know, how would you suggest we we move this ball forward? How can an institution like Harvard Business School, with its tens of thousands of alumni and its uh, its reputation and its independence, that and luckily we get to call ourselves Harvard too, because Harvard has a certain connotation that that somehow crosses the aisle. We have, we have a lot of we have Kennedy School graduates. You know, we have. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, so, so what, what is it that, that could be done to see if we could accelerate uh, this, what seems to be some promising seeds of, of thought uh, that, that I'm experiencing uh, going forward. Um, we, we had a number of, of sort of proposals and ideas, you know, about how to do that. Have you, have you covered any of that, Jim? No, not. Yeah. So let me just, let me just replay some of the thoughts we did. So, so one idea we had was, what, what if we had 1,000 Harvard Business School graduates? come to Washington on one day and literally descend on every, every member of Congress and talk about this issue. Would that matter? Would that make a difference? Um, we've had some, so I'm not going to tell you what the reaction we've got. So that, that, that's, <laughs> one, that's one reaction. That's one reaction. Um, could we have Harvard Business School graduates do a day with each member of Congress in their district? Uh, engage in a variety of efforts with constituencies and, and various entities at the district level uh, to talk about this issue. Um, uh, could we uh, convene some working groups on each of the eight areas, perhaps not the budget because that's been so heavily worked, but on the other, other seven areas, could we convene some working groups in which we provided our, our folks, our efforts, and our expertise with members uh, from both sides of the aisle to try to craft a specific uh, uh, consensus proposal in, in each area. Um, uh, the, the, these are these are three. Um, in, in the last meeting, Jim, you haven't heard this. Uh, there was a proposal that we uh, that we need to get our Harvard Business School alumni talking to their employees about this issue. Um, and spending some time helping them understand how this issue affects them and the company and their job and the ability to raise their wages over time. And, uh, 
because the, ultimately there's a disconnect between the management and, and the employees. The employees have not come along on this particular ride. So, so those are just four issues. Uh, let me stop there and just say that we'd be interested in the reactions to you know which of those might matter the most uh, uh, and any other thoughts you have. But I think at this point, uh, the problem is not understanding that we're in a serious fundamental structural uh, issue here. The problem is not the diagnosis of what our strengths and weaknesses are. I think we understand that. The problem is not even coming up with what are the you know, most important policy areas that Washington needs to move, move ahead on. The problem is all about you know, getting things done. And uh, so um, uh, we, we are so grateful that you've been willing to take your time and, and be part of this. Uh, we, we are committed to come back uh, over and over if we need to. Um, as long as we think that we can, we can add value, but we still are uh, in great need of advice and guidance on, on what would matter uh, to move the needle. We're delighted, delighted with partnership with, with ASP. I think you know, the competitiveness as we've defined it is the mother of all issues. It, it's the mother of inequality. It, it's the mother of foreign policy. It's the mother of almost every, anything that we try to accomplish in our society. If we don't have a vibrant economy, if we're not creating wealth, if we're not creating jobs with high uh, rising wages, we can't do anything. We have no resources in our society to solve any of the problems, deal with any of the social issues that we care so much about. So this is the mother of all issues, but it's an awkward issue because it's complicated, it's multidimensional, <coughs> the word competitiveness is you know, geeky and academic sounding, and uh, so, so how do we, how do we, how do we elevate the issue, and then how do we market it? That's, that, that's that's sort of my capstone. What I've learned from being here for uh, uh, these two days. Mike, we're delighted, of course, from ASP's perspective, to have Harvard join us. And uh, your surveys are fantastic. And I, I might add that the surveys, if I remember right, didn't just do the business community. You also did a public survey as a, as a corollary to it. And it, there's amazing similarities between the two. Uh, and we think it's a very compelling argument when you look at those surveys, then you look at the national security perspective, and then you come up here on the Hill. And some might ask, why are we up here on the Hill? Well, we're up here to influence your members of Congress, the Senate, and House side to hopefully uh, craft legislation that will uh, improve our competitiveness. And there's, it's wide ranging. There's eight topics to yours. We have six subsections on ours. Uh, so it's not an easy thing. And, and Mike mentioned, where do we go from here? Uh, we don't believe this is something we can let just have this panel today and then we're done and we'll see you next year. Uh, as you know, shelf life here in, in the House is pretty short and the Senate may be a little longer, but uh, we intend to continue to fan this flame and provide whatever assistance we can. With that, let me open up any questions or recommendations you might have from anybody here. And I see if you can please stand up, identify yourself, and hopefully keep your question fairly short, I would appreciate it. Rob Culler, right now. Uh, I'm in the private equity space. I had a chance to connect with Dr. Porter. Um, quick question, and then uh, sort of a comment to uh, one of the thoughts you had. Um, Dr. Porter, you're involved in All World as well. Um, mm -hmm. All World is a, a network of, um, of, of global initiatives. So the question is have you seen any data, have you all studied about uh, militaries who come back from service and overseas? and their propensity to get involved in either entrepreneurship, business, and the like there. That's just something that affects sort of my, my reaction back. I don't know about how many data on that score. I don't know if you have I've not seen data. And I've seen certainly impressions. We get more and more young military officers through our program. You know, we look for demonstrated leadership potential. And since you know, 2001, young military officers have had ample opportunity to demonstrate leadership potential. And it is a remarkable generation of young leaders coming through, who I think we will see have a huge impact. But in terms of real in, real data, Rob, I've not seen anything. Yeah. Are you talking just the entire population of veterans that are returning? Yeah, and, and it wasn't necessarily limited to the young folks. I think some of the, uh, the retirees as well, getting involved in boards, getting involved in advisory members and the like, that affects competitiveness. Now, too, the, the thought there that you had, Dr. Porter, on, um, on coalitions and the like, uh, Interesting idea about bringing alums to, uh, you know, to personally get involved. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they may be a little bit lighter on the wallet after that. But the, uh, that's supposed to be a joke. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I think the spirit of, uh, of coalitions could be one that you two involve other schools as well, other corporates with, you know, with uh, sort of uh, a win-win type interest. Yeah. 
um, in terms of uh, a different approach. But I, I find what you all are doing, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's interesting, uh, interesting concepts. Thank you for your comments. I, I think we haven't thought about you thought about doing other business schools and teaming sure. up. So that is one that is on the agenda. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Sarah Daniels, and uh, I I want to pick up on a point that Norman Augustine uh, brought in about um, education, and I think you know uh, you identify this gap that is been increasing, and um, you know uh, I just remember Robert Wright addressing the same point. Uh, of this gap because of the symbolic class, basically, symbolic analysts, you know, sort of be, you know, living in a, in a parallel universe, in, in a sense. And um, I was director of community education in Boston, in uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, and uh, it was a community schools program. And I think that the Harvard Business School has, you know, can, can really, uh, form alliances with the educational community at the high school level. Um, I know that Project Zero was attempting to do this at the education school, but I think that you know it, it has to break and you know people uh, into the community schools. Uh, you know, have critical thinking skills more. Um, you know, sort of develop this, this crit, crit, critical thinking that I think is so absent now in the high school. I see it. I talk with a lot. So that's my um, yeah, you talked about yeah. No, I did not mention this. One yeah. of the, the uh, formal efforts that has come from the competitiveness brush has been an effort to partner with the Gates Foundation and BCG to understand how business leaders can have a more effective impact in helping educators improve, potentially transform K through 12 education in America. You know, I, I believe that just adds to the, the, the bedrock. And not that you can yeah, personally involved and thought along these lines and efforts as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the it starts there. I mean, that is the raw input of a competitive economy yeah. is folks that can comprehend math, science, and generally just make sense of a very, very dynamic world. Um, so, for example, here in D.C., I mean, if you want a glimpse of what the nation is facing, I would say start here. Yeah. Take a right turn out of this building, keep walking, visit a few public schools and you'll get a real sense for uh, what's at stake. And if we can't get it right within the four quadrants of the nation's capital, it really just highlights that. And so there are a couple of organizations here that on the HBS clubs side, we've been working with um, the College Success Foundation, also sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to uh, increase college access for, for young kids in college and effectively paying for their tuition. Uh, but we have a number of groups within our country that are effectively lost generations. It's not only a question of uh, how, how often do you find um, folks with an undergraduate degree from a decent school, it doesn't have to be Harvard Business School, where the, the first degree is like a high school diploma 2.0. And so that's not only a case for we're not creating sufficient high-skilled jobs in the country, it's also a case for uh, the rest of the world is out educating the United States as well. And so starting at K through 12, that's the absolute raw input uh, that has to go into college, that has to then go into the workforce. Um, and I'm glad to see HBS has started to look into that. And your suggestions are great. And we're also seeing build businesses that are stepping up to partner with schools, community colleges, to make sure that people are being trained to be the employees the employers would love to hire. Right. Nothing's more frustrating than to, you know, do all the hard work to get a degree and not find a job at the other end. Yes, sir. So, Paul Rogge, I'm on the last month uh, active duty. I'm going to go back to the real world soon. Thank you, um, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, I, I think about a lot, besides competitiveness, is the need for resilience in our country. And I think there's a common root there in the approach. I'm not so much speaking to resilience, more of the common root. Um, it's occurred to me that really we need to look toward communities and, and regional dynamics to build actually both of these things. And so we tend to, in my view, overly focus on sort of what's happening in the edges of the east and west coasts, and really the energy, the food, the manufactured products all come from the heartland, and they all are, are produced by small companies that are, that are built and manned in, in these small communities. And so in addition to setting the conditions that we talked about a lot today, um, we might think about 
looking to the communities and in that sort of dynamic and see what could we do to help those communities move along, look at the councils of mayors, the governor's councils, and see how those people could be engaged, maybe elicit some ideas, and how they can even be mentored. There's a community and regional resilience institute at Oakridge that's going out and mentoring communities on resilience, and so maybe we could do something like that in competitiveness. That's a great recommendation. And kind of deflect this to our farmer from Tennessee who's gone back to the farm and worked with the small communities. Any comments on that, General Castellan? Well, one of the things, you know, uh, we have TVA down in our area, and that's uh, one of the big areas that uh, we're trying to look at is, uh, is how they're going to continue the uh, electrical get rid down there and distribute power and uh, bring in wind power from Oklahoma. And, Come. Yes, sir. My name is Lester Johnson. I was able to attend your other event here a few months ago, too. And um, first, I'm, I was kind of stunned that Harvard is doing this, actually going in and saying, we're doing this for society. We think this is the right thing to do. I've not seen a university do that kind of thing before. I'm actually a, a, a officer of the alumni club for the University of Chicago's Business School here in the area. So the one comment that somebody made about you know doing allegiances with schools, especially where you can get a dean that's going to be open-minded enough to get on, I think it just increases your scope. My talk to you here, but we'll take him on. All right. <laughs> I'm, happy, I'm happy to do that because I, I was it's very taken with what you guys are doing. I grew up in a town pretty much the way you grew up, like in the middle of Michigan. But I've been here in DC now for more than 30 years, I guess. Stuff like this that I've seen take place, I believe, takes a lot of coalitions. So this coalition here of wrapping this with security now, I think it's right. like changes, immediately changes the meaning of this whole thing. It's not a university, it's not a great university and a bunch of university guys. Now it's also security for the country and a university. And if you can wrap some others around this without <laughs> diluting it, I think that's what it's going to take. But I also <coughs> suggest that you're going to have to put some urgency on it and some goals for timelines on it or it just kind of works. Great comments. Uh, drop, drop me a card with your time. Don't go after the University of Chicago. The, uh, I guess they're all in the back. Uh, I'm Ralph Joker. I used to be in the real world a long time ago. Um, it, it's a very interesting presentation. Uh, I think that uh, the statement of Dr. Porter that you can't do anything unless you have a word with all to do it. I think that's very, that's very telling and very important. I hear people talking about education. I, I believe in education. I've had a lot of it. I've had some, some at the Harvard Business School, some at Yale Graduate School of Engineering, and some at Ohio State. Uh, that's a long-term solution. That's a, lead, that's a live barrier. Um, you do that, and you get a result way down the road. I think we really need to focus on short-term things to get a little bit of momentum going in the beginning. Maybe we have to relook at, at Dodd-Frank, and I'm not a finance guy, but, but some of the big corporations are complaining that it, it slows them down and it's expensive and it, and it doesn't produce a lot. The other thing we need to do, we need <coughs> to look, <coughs> to look at, uh, at, at the healthcare there are some people in, in the business world that are saying, I'm not going to hire because i got to keep the, my role flow because I can't afford to provide what, what, whatever is in this huge health care law provides. I think we got to look at short-term pay, pay dirt uh, operating op opportunities to get us a little bit of momentum going. I wouldn't argue with any of those points. I mean, today they're marking up immigration. Bill. I mean, that, that's the hot topic of the day. Yes. We'd love to see that one improved, especially on the H-1B side of the house. Tax reform is another hot topic of the day. And I, I'd say it's short term, but how long we been? When's the last time the tax reform rate? Um, you know, that could be long term, but it could be short term if people got around to it. Education is forever. I mean, it's going to start at kindergarten and it's going to end at graduate. But it's some 
think we all feel that it's important and we have to work with it. I used to run McCurdy for the Marine Corps and we go to high schools. It's sad to realize that 25 to 30 percent of today's kids aren't even graduating from high school and aren't, couldn't even walk in the door of a recruiter today. Got to have a high school diploma just, just to get in the door to get into any of the services. That's got to be fixed. I mean, that has to be fixed. But that's, that's a great comment. I think I can take one more. Uh, who have I not picked on? Yes, sir, right here. I'm um, John James. I'm a political consultant. I'm also a Harvard MBA and work, do some work with the Dante. Uh, Dr. Ford, at the beginning, you talked about the C word. It was a bad competitiveness. Let me tell you another C word that's even more of a problem here, and that's compromise. And just one example. Uh, General Cheney, when you were talking about H1Bs or, or, or we're talking about what we want to do with STEM, I think you're proposing someone's got a science and technology, engineering, and math degree. But let's bring them. Those are great ideas. Those are great ideas. But without compromise, um, let's take immigration. Unless Congress and, and also agrees to give citizenship votes, there is no way a bill like that is ever going to get out of the Senate. And if it did by a miracle, it would never be signed for the president. And I think what Harvard can do, and Chicago alums and the rest of them, what I don't, I, I, I suspect there was some hyperbole, but I heard Boehner or Cannon member 25 members yesterday, and every one of them reported back that not a single one of their constituents. Yeah, of, of support of the Senate bill. So whether that's true or not, I think clearly what we can do is, is educate. We have, when there are town meetings back in the district, we should be educating our folks. And your point was, and it shouldn't be just the Harvard MBAs. I, you were right on when you were talking about the employees. They should be going to town meetings. And they should be saying to members of Congress, look, I understand you're going to have to take some votes. I'm not going to agree with everything you do. But it's important that we make some sacrifices and, 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 and to get this, and I'm going to support you and I'm going to contribute and work. I think we're educating our people out, out there. So these, what, whether whether so Republican members in tough districts or who are worried about getting primary, so they can understand there, there is a support in, in their district for compromise and all that. I think that's part of what we're doing. That can make a difference. Because as long as these guys are convinced, if they vote for something like this and they're going to lose, we're not going to get them. You couldn't, you couldn't be more correct. And we're well aware of that issue. And we're trying to talk both sides of the aisle here. Yeah. Certainly the far right, if we can get in the door, say here's where we're going. That's the national security side of this house to say, pitch it to your constituents that you're going to impact their lives. Certainly the national security. We can prove that point. And we can prove that point. Uh, I would encourage everybody to go on our website, americansecurityproject.org. We are recording this today. It'll be uploaded here this afternoon or later this evening. We talked competitiveness uh, quite a bit there. We had our report put out last year. That's on there as well. The two surveys that Harvard's done have been fabulous. And uh, we're not going to let this dialogue die out. Your comments today were spot on. I really appreciate you coming today. And if you've got a member or a staffer that you want us to come talk to, contact us at American Security Project or Harvard Business School. We're right here down on New York Avenue. So it's just a Metro ride up for us, so it's not hard to do. But again, I appreciate everybody coming. Thank you very much.